I picked up this Lenovo P310 workstation a few weeks ago to see if it could function well in the role of a NAS or home server. But after noticing that the 400 watt power supply includes a 6 pin power cable for a graphics card, it made me wonder how well this might work as a gaming PC. Is this workstation, or one of many others like it, a good platform for a bargain gaming PC in 2022? Let's find out! This video is sponsored by World of Warships. I found this Lenovo P310 while browsing eBay, and was primarily interested because it features an Intel 6th gen Xeon CPU. The seller accepted my offer of $160, and I paid right around $200 after taxes and shipping. As I mentioned in the intro, I was pleasantly surprised to see that the included 400 watt power supply had a 6 pin connector for a graphics card, which is fairly rare in OEM desktops. This led me to slot in a GTX 1650 Super from my wife's PC, and it worked. While running benchmarks in my last video though, the power supply unfortunately failed. This surprised me a bit, because typically these workstation power supplies are pretty reliable. The included hard drive was also defective, so I probably could have returned the entire system, but making content is a bit more fun. So for the sake of this video, I'm going to use an EVGA 650 watt, 80 plus gold power supply that I got for $35 from Amazon Warehouse. But just know that had this system not been defective, something like a GTX 1650 or 1650 Super would work just fine with the original power supply. Before talking through the rest of the specs, I'd like to take a quick moment to talk about the sponsor of today's video, which just so happens to be a great game you could definitely play on this system. World of Warships is an incredibly fun, naval-themed MMO where you navigate battleships, destroyers, carriers, cruisers, or even submarines across 40 unique maps featuring dynamic weather and stunning water effects and textures. You can play by yourself or with a division of friends, taking control of one of the many breathtaking recreations of the most fearsome vessels from the First and Second World Wars. And it has new content released every month, whether it be new ships, cosmetics, or even ship classes. It runs really well on most gaming PCs, but is also available on console. To get started, head down to the link in the description below, where you'll be able to access a huge starter pack. Use code BRAVO during the registration to get 500 doubloons, 1.5 million credits, 7 days of premium access, and a free ship of your choice after completing 15 battles. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description below and start playing World of Warships for free today. Like I mentioned before, this desktop comes with a 6th gen Skylake Xeon CPU, specifically the E3 1275v5, 4 core 8 thread CPU with a base clock of 3.6 and boost clock of 4 GHz. This has a slightly higher base clock than the i7 6700, but is a bit slower than the non overclocked i7 6700K. 4 core CPUs are probably getting a little long in the tooth in 2022 but for many games, they should still provide plenty of horsepower, especially if you're not aiming for incredibly high frame rates. This system also came with 16 gigabytes of DDR4-2133 memory, which is the fastest speed that this motherboard technically supports. Speaking of the motherboard, it's fairly solid with decent I.O., six SATA 6 gigabit per second ports, and a PCIe Gen 3 by 16 slot for a GPU. Speaking of GPUs, this system actually came with one, an NVIDIA Quadro K1200, a low-powered workstation card that surprisingly still sells for close to $100 on the used market. I assume that people still buy them because they support four 4K display outputs and don't need external power. As I mentioned before, the PSU is a 400 watt unit and even sports an 80 plus platinum efficiency rating. As some very helpful commenters from my previous video pointed out, this high efficiency is probably achieved due to the fact that the power supply only delivers 12 volts to the motherboard via this 10-pin connector. Because of this, the SATA power connections for SSDs or hard drives actually come from these headers on the motherboard. If for some reason you need or decide to swap the power supply, you can use a 24 to 10 pin adapter, but the power supply continues to run when the PC shuts off. So you have to manually turn off the power supply with the switch on the back. 
I decided to put in a GTX 1650 Super because I think it'll be a good pairing with the 1275 V5 and it only has a TDP of 100 watts. So it should be totally fine with our 400 watt unit. It's also fairly small, so it shouldn't have any issues fitting into the P310's case, which is something to watch out for. I paid around $200 for the system, but should easily be able to get back at least $60 or so by selling the Quadro K1200. I already had this 1650 Super on hand, but you can currently find these used for around $140 or so on sites like eBay. I dropped in a 128GB SSD for a boot drive, but something like this crucial 240GB SSD can be picked up for around $25 right now on Amazon. This puts our system total right around $300, so let's see how this $300 system handles a few games. I tried to pick a decent selection of games that I thought might represent a wide audience of prospective buyers for a budget system like this, but because I'm using mostly my personal collection, some of these titles might seem a little strange. If there are any games that you think I should be testing with, feel free to put them in the comments below, and I might use them next time. Starting off, we have Hollow Knight, which I only included because it's the best game of all time. Obviously, this system has no issues running a simple 2D title like this, so let's get to something not so easy, like Call of Duty Warzone. Here, running at 1080p with low settings, we managed to get an average of 81 frames per second, with 1 and 0.1% lows of 42 and 21 frames per second. These percent lows are indicative of a decent amount of stutter, which you can see in the frame time graph, as well as the gameplay footage. But it was definitely playable, and a bit smoother when I set a frame rate limit of 60. Take note here that we're pretty heavily GPU limited, as that is a common theme moving forward. Minecraft Java ran very well, with high settings and render and simulation distances of 12 chunks. We have some not so great percent lows here, but this only really manifested when quickly traveling across the map, and running something like Optifine would improve the experience even more. CSGO doesn't like overlay software like MSI Afterburner, and I didn't take the time to get something else working. You can at least see the frame rate in the corner, and as you can see, we're consistently in the high 100s or 200 frames per second. I would say this qualifies as a competitive experience. Another favorite of mine is American Truck Simulator, which we have here running at the high preset. Driving across the Colorado countryside was a smooth experience, with an average of 85 frames per second, and 1 in 0.1% lows of 59 and 51 frames per second. Next up is Doom Eternal using the Vulcan API, which ran at a buttery smooth 95 frames per second on the high preset, basically never dropping below 60 frames per second. Another game I've enjoyed getting to actually play a little bit recently is Deep Rock Galactic. Here, running a mix of medium and high settings at 1080p, we get a very high average of 180 frames per second and 1 in 0.1% lows of 80 and 16. Although, I'm not entirely sure where that 0.1% low came from, as the game was very smooth for me. In Microsoft Flight Simulator, running low settings, we see an average of 68 frames per second when taking the Cessna 172 for a quick flight over Durango. The 1 and 0.1% lows weren't too bad here at 47 and 30 frames per second respectively, but there were still a few minor hitches here and there, especially when moving the camera around quickly. I imagine the frame rate would drop quite a bit at really dense airports as well, but it was still a very playable experience. This is another title that I imagine would benefit from turning VSync on or having a frame rate cap, but I doubt even that smoother experience would really help with my bumpy landings. The last game on the list for today is Halo Infinite, which in my opinion looks pretty good, even on low settings at 1080p. Here, the 1275 V5 and 1650 Super achieved 65 frames per second on average, and 1 in 0.1% lows of 40 and 29 frames per second, respectively. Even though these numbers were somewhat low, it was still a fairly smooth experience, and I wouldn't have guessed the percent lows would have been so low while playing it. 
Also, it's important to notice that this is really the only game on the list that wasn't primarily GPU limited. So what are my thoughts on this after seeing the results? Well, the first thing that stuck out to me was that we were mostly GPU limited, at least in the selection of games we played. If we were to look at certain other titles, especially some modern AAA games that heavily take advantage of 6 plus cores, we'd probably see less of this, but many games seem to still work okay with 4 core 8 thread CPUs, as long as you're using an entry level GPU and aren't in search of super high frame rates. We actually still have some headroom to upgrade the GPU to maybe a GTX 2060 or RX 6600 and see an actual improvement, although we would need to upgrade the power supply if we hadn't already. Whether or not this is a good deal probably depends on the titles you're looking to play. Many slightly older or less demanding titles will run great and will primarily be limited to the tier of graphics card you put in the system, but some newer or more demanding titles might start to push the 4-core Skylake CPU to its limits. Another thing to think through is upgradability. You can upgrade the GPU obviously, and could also upgrade to 32GB of memory, which might help in some games, like Warzone, where we can basically see all of our 16GB of memory being utilized. But the biggest limitation is going to be the lack of CPU upgrades. With this system, you could upgrade to a 7th gen i7 or Xeon CPU, but that won't net a massive improvement, and you'll still be limited to 4 core 8 thread parts. Now if you are interested in a system like this, you can try to find the exact same system, but that might be a bit difficult. Instead, you can find a lot of similar workstations or desktops in a similar price range. Let's head over to eBay and check out a few examples. So I did manage to find one Lenovo P310 that seemed like potentially a good deal. Uh, this one comes with the E3 1245 V5 instead of the 1275 V5, but really it's just a, a 100 megahertz clock speed reduction between those two chips. So it's only slightly slower. Um, this one comes with 16 gigabytes of RAM. A 256 gig SSD, but doesn't come with the Quadro K1200 or any graphics card, so you won't be able to sell that to make up some of the, the sunk cost, but it is for sale for $170 with free shipping, and you can make an offer on this. So you might be able to go make an offer on something like this for you know $140 and maybe they'll accept, and it could still be a pretty decent deal. While it's a little tricky to find some of the Lenovo P310s, there are a lot of similar workstations like this HP Z240, which I found this one here that has an E3 1270 V5, which is the exact same chip as the 1275 uh, V5, just without integrated graphics. Now unfortunately this one is a small form factor, so you would either need a low profile GPU, or you could move it to a new case, but it does come with 16GB of DDR4, a 512GB SSD, and a 1TB hard drive, and it also comes with the K1200, so you could potentially make an offer for, you know, maybe $180. Even if you paid straight up $200, you could possibly sell that K1200 back for close to $100 and, you know, have a pretty decent PC for $100. Bucks. And here's another HP Z240 workstation with the 1270 V5 as well, but 32 gigabytes of DDR4, a 256GB SSD, and this one's currently being bid on for 142 so no idea where this, this auction will end, but hopefully you can kind of see that if you browse around for some of these workstations, you can find some, some decent deals here and there. If you're looking for a budget PC, but don't want to be stuck with a 4-core CPU, your best bet would probably be to look into a Ryzen system. You can get something like a 6-core R5 3600, a B450 motherboard, and 16GB of DDR4 for around $200 used, but you'd still need to get a case, power supply, CPU cooler, and case fans to have all the components we managed to get in this system. That could easily start to cost more than double what we paid for the P310. Although, you would be able to easily upgrade to something like a 5800X3D down the road if you wanted a crazy fast gaming CPU. Now, I could talk all day about alternatives, and really it just comes down to knowing what you want to play and then doing research to find the best deal. If a system similar to this P310 suits your needs and you can find it for cheap, it might be a sweet deal. And if you get a workstation like this, it could be repurposed to something like a home server when you want to upgrade your gaming rig later on down the road. If you're interested in something like that, 
maybe take a look at some of my other videos covering that topic. I also want to take a moment to thank all of my patrons who help make videos like this possible. I just upgraded some of my recording equipment to help make better quality videos more quickly, and that wouldn't be possible without the support I get over there. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thanks for watching, stay curious, and I really hope to see you in the next one.